analyzing and understanding YDNA results and YDNA projects. How many of the men in the audience have submitted their DNA to a YDNA database? How many of the men have not? Well, the majority have. So I'm probably preaching to the converted. You can follow along my notes um, if you have your electronic devices, or you can just take down that address, pwaldron.info forward slash clans, and you can go back and read them again later. I'm recording this, and hopefully I'll get around to putting it up on YouTube, so those who are not here can listen to it at some stage, or if you want to listen back to it a second time, you can. Is that big enough on the screen, or should I blow it up? Can the people in the back row, Garrod, can you read that? Can you read the screen from back there? Give it one little bit higher. I'm going to try and squeeze all this into my allotted 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk first about clans, surnames, last names, as our American visitors call them, in DNA. Then I'm going to talk about particular types of DNA mutations we use to trace surname histories, SNPs and STORs. And I'm talk, going to talk about using DNA to estimate relationships between surname groups, between people with different surnames, and relationships within surname groups between people with the same surname. And I'm going to end by talking about how you can set up and administer your own YDNA projects. So I'm always a little perturbed by the word clan, because it reminds me of the Irish word clown meaning a family, and when I checked Ashter, one of the Irish language websites, I discovered that we have, as I knew, these three words in Irish, the clown, the tylock, and the wincher, which all mean slightly different things, but in English we might all translate them or translate them all as family. Um, what we're really representing here today are surname organizations rather than organizations of people who are known to be of the same bloodline. So I was glad to find the Clans of Ireland website acknowledges Irish clans were composed of those who were related by blood, but also by others, those who were adopted and fostered into the clan, those who joined for strategic reasons, but all members bore the same surname. So you can have the same surname as another man, but not have a common male line ancestor within the surname era, which goes back about a thousand years. And Clans of Ireland also on its website confirms that membership of an Irish clan is based on one's inherited and chosen identity and not on bloodline descent alone. So just because you don't end up with a Y-DNA match to somebody with the same surname, you're not going to be thrown out of the clan or you're not going to be disowned. Um, in fact, we're all related in this room. We're all descended from Brian Baru. Connor here in the front row knows exactly how he's descended from Brian Baru with a wonderful 32 or 33 generation pedigree. Uh, but if you do the sums, uh, you quickly see why we are all descended from Brian Baru and from any other Irish person alive in Brian Baru's time who has living descendants today. If you look at my pedigree chart, which I have here, I have two parents, I have four grandparents, I have eight great-grandparents, I have 16 great-great-grandparents, 32, 64, and so on. When you go back 10 generations, there's 1,024 people on your pedigree. That's about 300 years, back around 1700 AD. For most of us, we'd probably hope or think maybe those 1,024 individuals are all different. Um, but if we go back 20 generations, each of those 1,024 has 1,024 ancestors living around 1400 AD. So we all have a million slots to fill on that family tree, not just the 16 you saw on my chart. And there probably weren't a million people in Ireland in 1400. And those who were, many of them would not have descendants here today. So there's going to be a lot of duplication. If you go back 30 generations to Brian Baru's time, there are a billion slots to fill. There's nothing like a billion people in the whole world. Anybody who was alive 30 generations back and has descendants alive today is the ancestor of all of us here in this room. Uh, assuming, because we're here as clans of Ireland, we probably all have deep roots in Ireland. Migration to different continents would screw up the mathematics a little bit. So I estimate if you look at the person sitting beside you in the room, there's a 95% chance that that person is your 12th cousin or closer, because we're mostly of fairly pure Irish blood here. I know there's one Polish lady in the room, so maybe I have to make an exception for her. Um, so why do we feel a closer connection to people who share our surname? Um, 
We do, for some reason. And we form surname associations and clan associations. And one reason is that we expect if we share the surname, we share the Y chromosome. What's the Y chromosome? It's one of the four components of our DNA. Our DNA is made up of molecules of four chemical compounds, which we represent by the letters A, C, G, and T. Every man in the room has a Y chromosome. If you printed out the information about the molecules on the Y chromosome, it would run to 59,373,566 letters. Probably fill the whole room with paper. Somebody talked to me earlier about loving paper research, not DNA. I said, well, just print out all 59 million letters. You'll have lots of paper to work with. So where does our DNA come from? We all start out as a sperm fertilizing an egg. The sperm either has a Y chromosome, in which case the offspring is male, or the sperm has an X chromosome, in which case the offspring is female. The sperm brings 22 autosomal chromosomes or autosomes from the father. They pair up with 22 in the egg from the mother. The egg also brings an X chromosome. So a female has two X chromosomes, one from the father, one from the mother. A male has one X and one Y, one from each parent. The egg also brings a part of the DNA called the mitochondria. They all have their difference in different inheritance paths. The Y chromosome comes from, mine comes from my father, who got his from his father, who got his from his father, the same path that the surname traditionally follows. Brian Baru's Y chromosome survives virtually unchanged today, sitting here in the front row, although we know there's a handful of mutations which have been identified, uh, maybe one every hundred years or so, from 1014 down to today. I'm not going to say much about the X chromosome. You can get X DNA from any ancestor, as long as you don't go through two consecutive males going back up the tree to that person. Everybody here has probably seen the Ancestry DNA television advertisements for an analysis of autosomal DNA. That's the vast majority of our DNA. It's 22 pairs of chromosomes. The Y chromosome is just one single chromosome. We get half of our autosomal DNA from father, half from mother. On average, a quarter from each grandparent, an eighth from each great-grandparent, and vanishingly small quantities from ancestors in more distant generations. So very little of Brian Baru's autosomal DNA has survived the 30 generations down to the present. We all get our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. Male and female have mitochondria, but only females pass it on. Mother got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. So that goes back through the generations, even more unchanged than the Y chromosome. It's smaller and it has many fewer mutations. But do we ever think if we lived instead of in a patriarchal society in a matriarchal society and we took our surnames from our mothers, who are the relatives with whom we would share our surname? But we don't feel that same affinity, I think, in general, with people from the same female line as we do with people from the same male line. So what's really going on here is the combination of a linguistic thing. We have this word, the surname, and we have the DNA. And that's why we join in plans like those are gathered here today. Um, you may find you have a third cousin with whom you share no autosomal DNA. About 90% of pairs of third cousins share autosomal DNA. Only about 10% of pairs of fifth cousins share autosomal DNA. Certainly when you go out to 30th cousins, there'll be no recognizable autosomal DNA in common because it recombines in every generation. The fathers and the mothers get shuffled together. But if you take two 30th cousins Connor and somebody else with a 30 generation pedigree back to Brian Baru, they will have practically the same Y chromosome, unchanged in 30 generations. So if you haven't already submitted your Y DNA, you should do it as soon as possible. I hope to have kids with me today, but for various reasons, they didn't arrive in time. Um, but we can tell you how to order them later. And if you're a female, twist your brother's arm, your father's arm, your nephew's arm, your cousin's arm, or if you're a female and you're interested in your husband's Y-DNA, twist your husband or your son's arm. Your son will not have the Y-DNA associated with your surname. He will have the Y-DNA associated with his father's surname. So I mentioned a few times that we have occasional mutations on the Y chromosome. Uh, it's passed virtually unchanged. The surname is passed virtually unchanged. We will see many examples as I go on of how surnames do mutate, the spelling varies slightly. 
have come across some that I would never have expected that were confirmed by DNA. For example, Lindsay and Lynch have the same Y-DNA signature. So obviously at some point in past centuries, Oleinschig in one branch became Lindsay, Oleinschig in another branch became Lindsay. The one that really surprised me was in the Clancy project, which I run. There are many Clancy's, Glancy's with a G, Clancy's with a H, Clancy's with an E at the end. But there's also a man called Delancey. I lived beside Delancey Street when I was studying in Philadelphia many years ago. I never realized it was probably called after a relative. Someone anglicizing Mocklonica turned it into Delancey. Other people anglicizing it turned it into Mac Clancy and Clancy. So just as the spelling changes, the sequence of letters representing the Y chromosome can change with two types of mutation. There's a TLA, a three-letter acronym for each of them, and they both begin with S, and I hope I don't get tongue-tied and say the wrong one at any point in the talk. There's the SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism, and that's a single letter that gets mistranscribed going from father to son. An A changes to a C, and generally then the next generation has the C, and the next generation has the C, and so on. The second type is called the STR, the short tandem repeat, and there's an example of a sequence of four letters, C, C, T, G, repeated seven times over. And usually that will be passed on unchanged to the next generation, but occasionally there'll be an extra one or one will drop off and you might have six or eight repeats instead of seven. And you can use these patterns and try and figure out where in our mutation history tree did these mutations occur. The SNPs are the most exciting. They're new. There's been a SNP tsunami in the last five years or so. Uh, now there are over 160,000 of these. They're generally, the ones that are used to us are once in the history of mankind mutations. One man once, maybe 100 years ago, maybe 1,000 years ago, maybe 10,000 years ago, had this transcription error from his father's DNA to his own DNA. An A turned into a C or whatever. Now there are 160,000 of them. And if that happened in that man, all his descendants have that same transcription, all his direct male line descendants, no other man in the world has that transcription. So these SNP mutations divide people into what we call haplogroups, and they allow us to put the mutations on what we call the tree of mankind, or the human family tree, or the Y haplo tree. There's an early version of it. It starts with a single man, we call him Y Adam. It's not Adam from the Bible, who was the only man around at his time. He is the man who is the only man around at his time who has direct male line descendants still living today. He's estimated to have lived somewhere between about 160,000 and 300,000 years ago. And his descendants all had his Y chromosome for a while, and then there was a mutation, and the tree split into the A group and all the other groups, and then there was another mutation, and the other group split into the Bs and the Cs, and more mutations down along. And 20 or so years ago, when people started using Y-DNA for surname studies, they thought they didn't even need all the letters of the alphabet to represent all the different types of Y chromosomes. They only went up as far as R. They didn't need to go to Z. Now, rather than uh, 18 of these, we have 160,000 of them. And this is the tree that Family Tree DNA publishes. Most Irish men are in the ore branch of the original tree. And that has split again with more mutations. The numbers there tell you the number of customers of Family Tree DNA on each branch. So there's 9,870 on the M173 branch. Um, and over here, there are flags to tell you what country they're from. There's four people for whom this is the most recent mutation who live in Ireland, but most of those 9,870, when you expand the tree, have other mutations. There's 8,527 have this 343 mutation. You can see 124 of those are Ireland. And if we go down through about five or six generations, we come to M269, um, which is a mutation about 80% of Irish men have on their Y chromosome and about 8,000 customers of family tree DNA have this mutation. There it is. And of these 955, 
declare that their earliest known male line ancestor lived in England, 554, Ireland, 452, Germany, 390, Scotland, 362 just specified the United Kingdom without specifying what part. So I guarantee 80% of the men in this room belong in this group, or if they were customers of Family Tree DNA, they would go in this group. Um, so the idea now is to overlay surnames on SNP mutations and SNP mutations on surnames. And the nicest way that this has been done for people in that haplogroup or is the big tree compiled by a wonderful volunteer called Alex Williamson. Um, and here is the top level of the tree which just has the SNP mutation numbers. So it starts with P312 which is probably about 3,000, 4,000 years old then Z40451, and then that split into three branches, and this one split into two branches, and this one split into four branches, and so on. And we can look at some of the Irish branches of that tree with the surname added. There are two big clusters of Y DNA, or Y chromosomes in Ireland. One is theoretically traced back to Nile of the Nine Hostages. It's very common in the northwest of Ireland. The ge geneticists and the historians were looking for a man in Irish history who lived 1,500 to 2,000 years ago who's likely to have a lot of living male line descendants today. They set on Nile of the Nine Hostages, and that name has stuck. Technically, they just call it the M222 SNP. And this is a big branch. It takes a moment or two to load up. But we can see how the mutations and the surnames match up. While that one is loading, I'll open the Dalcashin one. That's the Clare one. That's the lineage to which the O'Briens belong. Um, and it's well documented in the annals as well. Here's M22 loading up. So here's a branch where they've all these SNP mutations, about a dozen of them, and the only men who have that mutation are Lally's. Then we have a branch over here, mostly McConaughey's with various spellings, but a few others thrown in as well. Um, and these are mutations that only some of the McConaughey's have in this block. These are mutations that a different subset have. So these are McConaughey-specific mutations. These are Lally-specific mutations. And as we scroll over to the right, you will see patterns of repeated surnames. That's a McKee branch. Um, there's a McGuinness branch with several different sub-branches, all McGuinnesses, but there's leeches, somehow are a descendant of the first McGuinness, a Duffy branch, and Boyle branch, and so on. And it's the same thing for the, the Dalcassians. Here's a Casey branch. These are all Casey-specific mutations. Here's a whole load of different O'Brien branches. But there's one little cuckoo in the nest here. There's one of them sitting down there in the middle of the room, Shane O'D. It turns out that um, there's a branch of the ODs or the O'Days, including a former and a future chieftain of the clan who have O'Brien DNA. They're more closely related to Connor here in the front row than they are to James sitting down in the middle, who's from the real OD family. <laughs> there's a Mar Marcy in here. That's another example of a surname DNA switch, probably at some point in history, a Don here. And there's also spelling mutations. There's Bryant, there's O'Brien with a Y, and there's O'Brien, as we're used to seeing it spelled in Ireland. There's Brian with no O. The spelling has mutated. The Y chromosome has mutated a little bit, but they're still certainly the same family. And because, what's your number, Connor? You're here somewhere. You two nine three double five. Can't remember. Anyway, you're one of the, you're one of those numbers there, or you maybe you're three zero two two five. Um, you're somewhere there in the, in, in the middle of the picture, and because we know Connor has a pedigree going back to Brian Baru, we know anyone else with these mutations is definitely descended from Brian Baru. But there are many O'Briens who don't have a Y DNA match with Connor, and therefore their surname either evolved independently or there's been a surname DNA switch into O'Brien somewhere in this past number of centuries. We estimate this O'Brien O'Day surname DNA switch probably happened maybe about five or six hundred years ago. Um, so you can copy your results if you're on family tree DNA and you have done the big Y test, the most expensive test, which is now called big Y 700, and you haven't already done so, you should copy your results into the big tree. The instructions are on the website. It's a straightforward procedure, and then you will appear in that other tree. And family tree DNA has recently added its own big Y block tree, 
which is an attempt to replicate the big tree. I don't think it's quite as good. Uh, I'm still logged in, so this will eventually load up my part of the block tree. And as I said, there's 160,000 snips or blocks on the tree, so it's stretching the internet to download all the information, but eventually it comes up. And here's my branch down here, and it just shows one match to me, and he's not a Waldron, he's a Warden. Similar, but I don't think it's a spelling variant. I think it, our common ancestry probably goes back uh, beyond the use of surnames. And there are people in these other branches, but because there's so many mutations between me and them, family tree DNA doesn't show me who they are. So they say roughly one mutation per century. The common ancestor of me and these other three branches is back 15 mutations ago, probably about 1500 to 2000 years ago. Um, so before the surname era. But we still have similar Y chromosomes, but we don't have the same surname. So what about working the other way? Starting with the surname tree, we have O'Hart's Irish pedigrees available online. The Dalcassians are descended from Cos, who lived in about the 4th or 5th century, I think we'll see a date in a minute. He had 12 sons, the ancestors of all the Dalcassian surnames. So with 12 sons, it's not surprising that he has lots of male line descendants alive today. This is a tree of the Dalcassian surnames put together by a wonderful Australian gentleman called Dennis Wright. I just heard he'll be coming over to speak at the McGrath gathering in June. Um, and he's responsible for the development of the haplo tree of the Dalcassian L226 surnames. And down here at the bottom, you have O'Brien, the main Dalcassian surname, Maconsidine, McMahon, Eustace O'Kennedy, some McGraths, Cosgraves, O'Hogans, and so on. Lots of different surnames. And he's traced them all back using the annals back to Cos, and he has mapped the Y chromosome mutations that correspond to the changes in surnames. There's another version of this tree which is on Wikipedia, I think, which I'm not so convinced by, because up here at the top, I see my mother's maiden surname, Durkin. Um, I'm in the Durkin surname project, and the Y DNA of the Durkins is very consistent, and it is not Dalcassian. So either the annals are wrong, or there's been a surname DNA switch at some point, and the Dirk and surname is being used by people who are not male line descendants of Koss. And there's a different subset of surnames on that one from Dennis Wright's collection. Um, so let me show you a few more examples of surname-specific mutations, SNP mutations, that I have worked out. I'm involved with the Marinin clan. I don't know whether they're registered with clans of Ireland, but they have a very active clan, and they're meeting in Ennis Diamond in August. They meet every two years, every second gathering in Ireland and in somewhere overseas. Uh, so here we have the mutations B19488, B19489, and so on, which have so far been found only in Marinin men. Two Marinin men have done the big Y test, and they're perfect matches. We thought for a while maybe the first Marinin was an O'Loughlin, because this O'Loughlin was a generation further up, but then this guy called Bowman came along, and he knows there's a surname DNA switch somewhere several generations back in his ancestry, and he's a closer match to the O'Loughlin, so now it's not 100% clear did the Marinin chicken come before the O'Loughlin egg, or vice versa. Um, but it's a very nice way to try and figure out when surnames originated. All the Marinins match. I figure it's not a very old surname. It might be only four or 500 years old. And maybe the first Marinin wasn't a Lachlan. Uh, what about the ODs? I'll come back to the Marinin project. Uh, we looked at the O'Brien branch already on the Dalcassian tree, the DC782s. Here we have all the O'Briens. In the middle of them, we have one O'Day. And we have a project page. Family Tree DNA is the main company that analyzes the Y chromosome, and it provides the infrastructure to run surname projects. I administer or co-administer about half a dozen of them. This is the list of results for the OD project. Um, and I start each group with the letter of the original top-level haplogroup from that ancient version of the tree by 20 years ago with the 18 letters. We have a couple of ODs who are on the E branch. We have one who's on the G branch. We have a few who are on the I branch. That's the second most common in Ireland. People think of it sometimes as the Viking branch. 
in this column you have the haplogroup if it's confirmed with a SNP test or down here if it's in red it's been predicted using these older STR markers which I'll talk about in a minute and if we scroll down the big groups are all down here in this coral color they're all Dalcassian subgroups these ones I can't assign to either of the main branches um, these ones have the terminal SNP DC135 uh, that's James's lot and they probably have been using the OD surname since the Battle of Dicer OD and before um, and down here we have the ODs who match the O'Briens, Shane and his group who only adopted the OD surname subsequent to Dicer OD maybe five or six hundred years ago and I can predict by looking at other things even though these ones haven't been tested for the 5212 SNP they're going to turn out positive for it and the same ones up here anyone who's in red or who has a higher level SNP I can predict with confidence they'll be 135s and we're waiting for more results from these 135s we may discover a more recent mutation which is OD specific and I come back to this little cuckoo in the nest here in a moment uh, in fact it's the next thing on my list uh, Shane came up with the story when it turned out to be an O'Brien. He said, oh, I was always told growing up the ODs and the O'Briens fostered each other's children down through the Middle Ages. So I think what must have happened was that an OD family fostered an O'Brien child, and for some reason, against the usual practice, that O'Brien child grew up with the OD surname because he had been raised as a foster child in an OD household. That's pure speculation, but it seems a feasible explanation as to what happened. Uh, DC135 is the, the older OD branch, and we have a story from 1566 in County Kilkenny of a Thomas Fitzgerald, which is Fitzgerald, alias AD, which is a variation of OD, from Grutchens or Gertines in County Kilkenny, gentleman who received a pardon. A lovely local history book, which James OD came up with, uh, called Sleeve Rua, A History of Its People and Places, and the author Jim Walsh asks, did Thomas O'D of Gertines adopt his wife's surname, which was Fitzgerald, on occasion out of political expediency in his dealings with the Tudor government, or did he have a Geraldine pedigree after all? Well, the DNA, we saw there a Fitzgerald in the middle of a whole bunch of ODs with the Fitzgerald DNA signature, sorry, with the OD DNA signature, but the Fitzgerald surname. So I think this confirms that our 16th century Thomas Fitzgerald started life as an OD and because he was dealing with the Tudor authorities adopted the Fitzgerald surname and his descendants have the Fitzgerald surname down to today but they have the OD DNA signature. Um, so I've mentioned the idea of the terminal SNP. Each name in those tables has a SNP associated with it. It's terminal in the sense that it is the most recent that has been identified. It can change for two reasons. Uh, maybe the person hasn't had the Y chromosome fully analyzed. It costs $649 to get the top of the range test. It costs $149 to start off with the basic Y37 test. So as somebody buys more testing, the terminal SNP will be changed to a more recent one. Or what can happen is as they look along the Y chromosome, they may find a mutation that hadn't been seen before and find that that occurs in two people from the same family and that then becomes the terminal SNP of those two people and supersedes the older SNP that they might have on the charts that we looked at. And ultimately, the idea is to combine all these mutations, SNPs and STIRs into mutation history trees and people are trying to design software that will automatically do that. This is one program I played with a little bit called SAP still another phylogeny program. Phylogeny is just another bit of genetics jargon and you can put in the data from your surname project into that and it will try and build it into a tree. For the Dalcassians there's a man called Robert Casey in uh, the southern states in America who has developed great software including SAP to build a mutation history of all the Dalcassians of whom he now has several hundred um, and it's a, it's a fascinating tree. I'm not going to show you the actual tree. So, how many of you have done SNP testing? Handful. So I strongly encourage the rest of you, talk to your project administrators, talk to me if you want, and we'll work out single SNPs or SNP packs that you can order, or go the whole hog 
and buy the big Y for $649. I can organize a discount code off that for you through the DNA Outreach Ireland project. And we may discover new science, new mutations that haven't been seen before that are hiding away in your Y chromosome. The STR comparisons were the original Y-DNA product, we'll call it, 20 years ago. Um, nowadays, if you find two men with a different terminal SNP, you can say they're not related, at least back to whenever that SNP mutation occurred. The STR mutations can go in both directions. So you can have reverse mutations. So I think of it as SNPs will confirm relationships beyond a reasonable doubt, like you'd say in a criminal case if you were a lawyer. The STR mutations, because they're much more variable, mutate more quickly, mutate in both directions, they give you good signals and they'll indicate something on the balance of probabilities. But you'll still have a doubt in the back of your mind until you go down the SNP route and do the more modern testing. But we still, generally people, unless they decide to splash $650 straight away, start with the older Y37 entry-level purchase. Um, and you can get that $149 price by ordering through a project. So you join your surname project first, or you join a geographical project. One of the projects I run is the Clare Roots project. So if we scroll over here, because I've done that link through the Clare Roots project, you get the $20 discount. So don't ever pay the full $169, join a project. And you're helping everyone, you're helping yourself, you're helping the other project members, and you're helping your bank balance by getting the $20 off. That's why they give you the $20 off. Um, so let's look at the STR values for the Marnon surname. This is quite the most remarkably consistent surname when it comes to Y-DNA results. We have 12 Marnons in the project. We have five different spellings. We don't have a Merriman. They say that the poet Brian Merriman, the author of A Midnight Court, famous 18th century Clare poet, was probably a Marnon. Uh, but he had only daughters, so we don't have his DNA or his descendants' DNA to confirm it. We've Marnin with a double R, we've Marnien, we've Marning, we've Marnen, we've Marnin with a single R. Anyone who's done SNP testing has BY19489 in green as their terminal SNP. We can be pretty sure those who haven't done the SNP testing will almost certainly test positive for that. We may eventually find one of two things. We may find a Marnin who doesn't have the BY19489 SNP. That proves that the first man who had that mutation was already a Marnon, and that there's two parallel branches in the family, one with the mutation, one without the mutation. Um, or we may find the other way around, uh, someone with another surname that has that mutation, and that looks like two men with different surnames had the mutation three or 400 years ago. And that means the mutation came first and the surname DNA switch to Marnin came after the mutation. Over here, we have 111 columns with the values of the STR markers that have been observed for all these people. You notice all the Marnins have a 13, then a 24, then a 14. If there's a difference, it's highlighted in color. So the first guy has an 11 for that marker where everyone else has a 12. There's a 29, a second marker with a difference there's some 19s and some 35s. So out of those first 37 markers, all 12 Marin and ma men match on 33 out of the 37. Gets even better, only six of them have done the 111 markers. So there's blanks as we scroll over, but there's no colors. And eventually as we get over to number 111, there's a 24 down there. So there's only one of those last 74 markers of which there's any difference between any of the Marin and men. Uh, they all describe their most distant known ancestor. You get 50 characters to describe the most distant known ancestor. Um, and into that you have to squeeze the name, a place, and a date. Not everybody's put everything in, so I'm not sure whether John Marin in 1790 and John Marin in Kilkee are the same man. I think there's 11 different most distant known ancestors represented there, born in the early 1800s back to the early 1700s. So my theory is the common ancestor of all these Marinans can't have been a whole lot before 1700. Then we've men with female Marinan ancestors that we let into the project. Then there's a theory maybe Marinan is a variant of Marnan, but we've one Marnan, he doesn't match the Marinans at all. That 
and certainly on that sample of one, we reject that theory. And then the Delanceys, one branch of the Clancys, they're genetically close to the Marinans, but be back before the surname era. And I'm not sure why the two O'Shea's joined. They have no known Marinan ancestry, so they're down at the bottom. Um, okay, so when, when you send in your DNA for the STR test, you get back a list of matches. You would expect the people who match your Y chromosome to be a set of men with the same surname that you have yourself. And people get upset and disappointed when they find that isn't the case. There's a long set of reasons there why that might be the case. Uh, your surname may be in danger of dying out because your ancestors only had one son each and lots of daughters or sons who didn't marry, so there is nobody to match you. I was talking to Joni there from the OD clan. She has an OD five generations back with no male line OD descendant. Uh, there may be nobody in the database. There's an example. Geheran is a Leitrim surname. I never heard of it until I was contacted by the wife of a famous American sportsman who was adopted and in his 70s was trying to trace his birth parents. And he discovered he's a Geheran through autosomal DNA testing. But he's not going to find any Y DNA matches because there's no customer of family tree DNA with that surname. And the first Geheran who signs up is going to think he's a Palmer because Palmer is the adopted person's current surname, which is his adoptive mother's second husband's surname, which he ended up carrying. <laughs> so surnames do not always follow the male line. I did the history show with Miles Dungan one year just before the Genetic Genealogy Ireland conference. I persuaded him to swab. He has some chance of finding a match. There are 16 Dungans among the family tree DNA customers. That doesn't mean they all ha are men, and it doesn't mean they all are Y DNA customers. They may be females, or they may be men with only autosomal DNA results, so they may still be waiting on results. Uh, lots of other reasons that you can read through yourself as to why your matches don't look like you expect. Mine certainly didn't. On the 111 marker test, there's my match list. Nobody comes within 10 differences out of 111 of me on the first 111 markers. I'm kind of unique, but if I drop down to 67 markers, and for privacy reasons, we're supposed to block out people's names here. I have a number of matches. Mr. Cheney doesn't match me on 111, so we have a lot of differences between 68 and 111. Mr. Cady doesn't match me on 111 because he's only bought the first 67. And down here, I didn't need to block out this lady for privacy reasons because, of course, it's, if she's Roberta, it's not her DNA, so she's already using a pseudonym for the man who provided the DNA. So I do have some 67 marker matches, but there's no Waldron in there. Um, and I have a theory. The first reference to Waldron I have found in Ireland is a man who came in with the Ulster Plantation in 1609, and he has a well-documented pedigree, and the surname has been daughtered out. I cannot find a male on that extensive pedigree of the 1609 man's descendants with whom to compare my Y DNA. So obviously, if my great great grandfather, which is as far back as I can go, was the only living male descendant of the man who came in in 1609, I'm not going to find any Irish Waldron Y DNA matches. Um, people always ask, how far back is the common ancestor of two matches? There's a thing called the tip calculator, which tells you, I picked somebody with a generic surname here that I didn't need to block out, and myself. It says there's a 9% chance that he and I share an ancestor within four generations, a 47% chance that we share one within eight, an 80% chance we share one within 12, and 93% chance we share one within 16. Nobody has ever told us what's the, the black box algorithm behind these calculations. I tend to think they overestimate the closeness of the relationship. I suspect this goes back before the surname era more than 30 generations ago. Um, so don't put a whole lot of weight on it, but at least it gives you a ballpark figure. And as I said, when we looked at the SNP trees, roughly one mutation per century is the rule of thumb people tend to use. I've already talked you through the Marinan project. Let's just look at another project that I'm not involved in, where there's a wide variety of different um, origins of the surname. You already saw the ODs with a fairly wide variety of origins. Here's the Carol, some from haplogroup E, some from I, um, and then, as usual, plenty from Ors. These are the O'Carules of Ossery, a big group, not all with the O'Carroll surname. 
but related surnames again, a bit like the Dalcassians, Ossery surnames probably going back before the surname era. Um, then there's the Okarul of Loch Lane, completely different signature. Other smaller groups, Okarul of Ayla at the bottom, Okarul of Oriel, uh, Okarul of Tara, all divided according to their DNA signatures, matching up with the different O'Carroll families discussed in the, the, the annals of Irish history. So how do you set up a project? Um, you can have a surname project. James there persuaded me to set up the OD project with him. We now have 102 members. We had a very successful clan gathering last May where I presented the initial YDNA results. We put together that introductory page to tell people how the project works. Anybody can see that. And if you're not a member, there'll be a join button up there that you can use to join. Um, I run the Clare Roots project, which is for anyone with ancestors in Clare. That now has over 1,200 members. And again, I've got YDNA results pages for that, but we also use Autosomal DNA Family Finder for that. If you know your haplogroup, you can join a haplogroup project. Dennis Wright and Robert Casey and others run the L226 Dalcashen Irish Type 3 project with Tremolin Castle at the, the top of it, and uh, that's an excellent project. If you're a Dalcashen, you're very lucky to have those administrators analyzing your results for you. Um, if there isn't a project, you can set up your own. If you want to get full benefits from the project, there's a few links there telling you how to set your privacy settings so that you get the most benefit out of the projects. Family Tree DNA have gone paranoid about GDPR since last year, and they've locked everything down. Um, on the other hand, the, the weirdest interpretation of GDPR, if you want to be a project administrator, you have to have your email address available to anyone in the world on the Family Tree DNA website, including all the spammers who want to, you to help them really get their 40 million out of Nigeria, and send you Viagra and whatever. So I do recommend if you do this, um, set up a separate email address for it, because God knows what happens when you put your email address out in public. Um, I consider it a data breach, but FTDNA says it is required by GDPR. Uh, there's an application process to set up a project. Who here is already a project administrator? One, two, three, four, only four. In the Clans of Ireland gathering, I would have thought every hand should have shot up. How many of you are in clans with a project administrator who's not here today? A few more have projects. Uh, it says step one of five. It's really only four steps. It doesn't take that long to fill in. Uh, keep a copy of your answers, answers in case it goes astray, which has happened once or twice, or in case you want to set up a second project for a second surname and you can use the same answers again. Within the project, we have activity feeds where the members and the administrators can ask each other questions. Um, this is the activity feed for the Clare Roots project, I think, which is trying to load up. Um, eventually it'll get there. There we go. So I've put up some pinned posts at the top. People don't read what you put up. I ended this one. Please do not add comments to this welcome post. There's now 102 comments. <laughs> so be prepared to deal with people who don't read the instructions. Um, and you can see all the different questions and answers down along there. And I need to go back and answer a few of those that are overdue an answer. You can put people in subgroups. I've showed you the results pages. Where do those results pages come from? They come from the subgroup editor. Uh, the subgroups are listed alphabetically. So think about what order you want them to appear in. And you can put A, B, C, D in front of them if you want them to appear in a, a different order to the natural order. Uh, this is the OD subgroups. And I tend to use the, the SNP tree progression all the list of SNPs down to the most recent one. And that makes it easier um, to see the connections between different subgroups. So down here, where's my L226s? You can see I have all these L226 groups along here, and I can see that, that they're all different subgroups of L226, because L226 appears in, in the subgroup title. There are different styles of doing it. Um, some people don't do any subgrouping. Some people, I think, need their hands held. Um, to show how to do it. You can use surname, geography, haplotree, precision. You can put people with different terminal SNPs together if they're 
from close branches on the haploid tree. You can choose your own color scheme. Be careful not to play around with the colors because people like me with bad eyesight can't read them if you use too many different colors. Um, you're limited to 161 characters for a subgroup name. If you want to put in all the progression of SNPs from Brian Baru down to the present day, Connor here has gone way over the 161 characters, so I have to have out separate nodes for his subgroup. The other nice thing we have as project administrators is a genetic distance calculator. You're deemed a match if your four differences are less out of 37 apart, seven or less out of 67 apart, 10 or less out of 111 apart. But a project administrator can see matches just outside those thresholds, which can be very useful. So for example, here's a man that has only one match on his 37 marker test. He's in the Claire Roots project and he has three other matches who are seven out of 37 away from him. It shows me what subgroup I put the four matches in. They're all in the M222 Nile of the Nine hostages subgroup. So I can be very confident that this man on the basis of his first 37 markers and a single match is from the Nile of the Nine hostages group. And then he can order the Nile of the Nine hostages M222 SNP pack for another $119, I think it is, and get his terminal SNP a lot more cheaply than paying the full $649 for the big Y test. On the other hand, these are my own results from the uh, genetic distance calculator. You saw I've no matches at 111 markers. This is from the Claire Roots project. Um, my closest match within the project is way outside the 10 out of 111 cutoff. It's 29 out of 111. My big Y results say that I'm from the ancient U106 branch. Of all my close matches within the project, there's only one down here is from that U106 branch. So I'm so far away from everybody else with Claire Roots. It's not very helpful in my case. How do you recruit members to your project? Uh, you can get Family Tree DNA to send out an email to everyone in their database who's willing to receive emails once every six months, inviting them to the project. The administrator can see the email addresses for people who match men who are already in the project, and then the administrator can email them directly, say, I see you're an OD, or I see you match an OD, please join my OD project. And you're all in plan organizations with mailing lists uh, for people with the surname, and you can write to everyone in your clan organization and say, please sign up for our DNA project. So just to summarize, why should we do it? The bigger the database, the more people we have to compare from, the more interesting discoveries we make, uh, get people to join. But there's no point in getting your brother or your son or your father to join if you're already in there, because you can be pretty sure they have the same Y chromosome. And if there's any doubt, a family finder test for $79 will prove one way or the other who they are, spend that money on getting more SNP tests or big Y tests for the man who's already in the project. There are significant positive externalities. Uh, your female relatives, if you're a male, will be very grateful to have your Y DNA. Um, and there may be somebody else out there with a surname DNA switch in their lineage struggling to figure out what their genetic surname is. They'll be delighted that you're in there with a proven pedigree. We need to get more Irish men into the Y-DNA databases, more Irish women into the Family Finder autosomal and mitochondrial DNA databases. Your descendants will be eternally grateful to you for your autosomal DNA because you've only passed on half of your autosomal DNA to each of your offspring. Your female descendants will be eternally grateful for your sample of your Y-DNA that you haven't passed on to them. And it's only if you have male line descendants that you're absolved from the parental responsibility to preserve and record your own Y DNA, because if you have male offspring, they can do it for you. But if you don't, nobody else can do it for you. And there at the end is a list of further reading. Um, I think I was seven minutes late starting and I'm seven minutes late ending. So hopefully I haven't taken up too much time. I don't know whether we have time for questions or not, but thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope you'll all sign up. <laughs> Anyone want to ask any questions? Stunned into silence. <laughs> German. What's your conviction at this stage of Waldron? Of Waldron. My conviction of Waldron. I think I'm almost convinced that I came in with the Ulster plantation. My dear departed cousin Thomas de Waldron would be 
turning in his grave at the thought, I'm sure, because our his grandfather and great grandfather were RIC men, and he used to say, "Via Maria Shervish and now it." We were we were serving the enemy. Uh, the interesting thing about Waldron is when my aunt went to study Irish in UCD in the 1930s, Douglas Hyde was the professor, and my grandfather had called himself O Waldraha, and she was calling herself Ni Waldraha. And Douglas Hyde, being from Roscommon near the Waldron heartland around Ballyhawn, has said, "Oh no, Waldron is of Norman origin." Uh, you should be De Waldraha. So that's why we have De Waldraha's dictionary and not O Waldraha's dictionary. Um, but there are, we have, have a Waldron clan association run out of the Ballyhawness area, which has gone sort of dormant in recent times. People have died and run out of steam. And I do have Y-DNA from three Waldron men with roots around that area. And none of the four of us match any of the others within the last 5,000 years. So it's a multi-origin surname. And if you think back, um, there were Irish surnames in Mayo, which were probably Mockwalder and De Waldraha and Mockwaldreen. Even as late as Griffith's valuation in Roscommon, you see a lot of Walders. So Waldron was the English surname that came in in 1609 that sounded most like the native Irish and Norman surnames. And when surnames were being standardized, the spellings converged on the Waldron spelling. I think that's what happened.